Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for our fourth virtual program this year. My name is Bunty Chand, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Asia Society India Center. And Asia Society's programs across our 14 centers have now become virtual and, uh, and global. So uh, this is the third program that the India Center is hosting uh, in our series called Overcoming the Pandemic. And previously, we've discussed food security and we've discussed uh, demystified, uh, demystifying coronavirus data. And uh, in case you want to watch any of those programs, they can be found on our Facebook page. And um, while trained medical professionals are essential in responding to an epidemic, given the scale in India, uh, I think mobilizing community participation is imperative. And the Indian response to the pandemic was accompanied by a swift mobilization of nine lakh strong ASHA workforce in, it, in cities, towns, and villages. So today, what we are uh, uh, trying to do is uh, to talk about the community service program that uh, India has in place uh, in the cities and in uh, uh, areas where medical services uh, uh, are challenging. So from slums in Mumbai to towns in Kerala and villages in Uttar Pradesh, the ASHA workers have been carrying out the essential work of conducting surveys, collecting data, and disseminating factual information. And uh, uh, we thought that we would do this program because uh, I think this is um, uh, uh, there are lessons uh, to be learned from what India is doing as far as uh, community health care uh is concerned and uh, we hope that we will have a global audience uh, for this program and it's interesting you know uh, while um, uh, the programs are watched only by uh, you know uh, tens of people when it's uh, uh, online but after the program the program is often watched by hundreds and at times thousands one of our programs had i think a 5000 views by uh, the end of uh, like a week so, um, so don't be discouraged if you don't get lots of questions uh, during the program. So, and I'm I would like to welcome my expert panelists today, uh, uh, Dr. Rajni Ved. We are very grateful that you took the time to join us from Delhi. Uh, Rajiv Sadanandan and Nairin Daruwala and uh, Dr. Sapna Desai. And um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sapna, who, apart from being an associate at Population Council, and having formerly worked at SEVA, she's also an alumnus of Asia Society's Young Leader Program called Asia 21. And so she's moderating the discussion today. And since she's calling in from Himachal, if we have technological difficulties, please just stay on the line with us. And, um, and just a few, uh, a bit of housekeeping before we proceed. And all of those who are joining us on Zoom, please leave your questions in the Q&A section. And for our audience on Facebook, please drop them in the comments section. And now I'm going to invite Sapna to introduce the panelists and commence the discussion. Sapna. Thank you so much, Banti, for organizing this. And as the panelists will agree, we all know public health is an applied science and it's one of implementation. So I couldn't think of three better people to bring together to really understand what's happening at a systems level, at a state level, and at the community level. So thank you all three for joining. So I'll first start by introducing the panelists um, to the audience. But you know, I wanted to make a point that because of the type of expertise we have in this group, it's important to remember that these questions are relevant to COVID, but they're also really important to understand about community health in general. Keep that view when we listen that these aren't problems that India is facing for the first time. Uh, community health has been on an agenda and a very important part of the agenda of development since India's independence. But at the same time, we've had a lot of challenges, yet in states like Kerala, a lot of successes. So when we learn from the three of you, I hope we can understand not just what's happening today, but what investments need to look like in the future to strengthen public health in general. 
So I'll start with Dr. Rajni Ved. Um, as you probably know, she's the Executive Director of the National Health Systems Resource Center, the NHSRC in Delhi, which provides technical support to the Ministry of Health at both the central and the state levels. Um, Rajni has been with the ASHA program since its inception, and she also works very closely on supporting the initiation of comprehensive primary health care amongst other things, and scaling up innovations that we've learned in community participation, for example, in other places, and scaling them up to the national level, both through health workers and through the health system. Uh, Rajni, thanks so much for joining. Our second panelist is uh, Rajiv Sadanand, as Bunty mentioned, is the CEO of the Health Systems Transformation Platform, which is a non-for-profit engaged in health systems research. Rajiv, of course, brings a huge wealth of experience from having formerly been Secretary of Health in Kerala and also CEO of the Rashtra Swastha Bhima Yojana, the National Health Insurance Program, which was the predecessor to today's PMJ in certain states. Um, Rajiv has also been deeply involved in developing and managing TB and HIV AIDS programs, so we hope to learn lessons from pre previous epidemics as well. And third and last, but certainly not least, is Nadine Daruala from Sneha in Mumbai. And Nadine heads the Prevention of Violence Against Women and Children program at Sneha. She has an expert in social psychology and has been working towards the prevention of gender-based violence for over two decades. And importantly, Sneha has been at the forefront of innovating community participation, organizing women, organizing services from the bottom up. So it's important to hear not just from the systems level, but how do we make those linkages with people and reaching the most vulnerable? So thank you again. And how we'll start is I'm going to ask each of you from your perspectives and your vantage points to give us a bit of an overview of different um, situations that are happening right now with COVID. I'm going to start with you, Rajni. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been seeing over the past few months about the role of the ASHA in the response to COVID? What have been the different responses across states? Because as we know, states have performed very differently. And in the response of the ASHA, what has been the systems report, uh, support that's really required? And where do you see the largest challenges? And then I'll follow up. OK. Um, thank you, Sapna. Thank you for the introduction and uh, for the questions. So uh, let me start, first of all, by saying that um, I think when COVID hit us, there was this recognition that no matter how vast our network of public health facilities, we really didn't have anybody in the villages except the ASHA. Um, and so I think from the time the intervention started, there was every, every ASHA in the field was engaged. And interestingly for us, because we've always postulated that the performance of the ASHA depends upon the state of the entire support structure of the ASHA, how her incentives are paid, whether her drug kit is refilled, we found instead across the states, all ASHAs and every state had included the ASHAs in their response. And so it didn't really matter if the ASHA training was slow in some states and hadn't taken off in others. For the COVID response, it was almost a uniform and instantaneous engagement of the ASHA. Um, so from whether it was doing household visits, whether it was doing surveys to identify those who traveled, those with symptoms, ensuring quarantine, ASHAs took on a whole range of roles. And it was also very interesting that some states uh, used ASHAs not just by themselves, but as teams from the block level and the district level. So they formed part of rapid response teams in Kerala. For, in Kerala, for instance, I know that volunteers were engaged in addition to ASHAs and with the PRI, they, they played a stellar role. I, I can point out one contrast though, and this says a lot for the maturity of the ASHA program in rural areas versus the ASHA program in urban areas. So at this point, I can't distinguish between state level responses I think all states, wherever ASHAs were active, did well. But because the urban ASHA uh, maybe has not had enough time, the rural ASHA is 15 years old, the program, the urban ASHA program is about seven years old and not as well supported as the rural ASHA program. You did see a lot of gap in responses in the urban ASHA program. So I think that the difference, and, and this was where we needed the ASHA's activity the most and in urban areas where we were not able to do that. Um, so I think the variation in states, that was your question, depending on what level, of, it didn't really matter at this stage. I think ASHAs wholeheartedly came into the picture. And I know we've seen media reports about ASHAs not getting insufficient uh, protect, protection, um, that perhaps the incentive that was promised a thousand rupees is not sufficient. Yes, all of those things are true. Um, but 
this also equally true that wherever there were instances of harassment, whenever it came to the state's notice that in such and such a block, the Ashas hadn't received, the state was equally prompt to respond. We haven't seen this kind of a response to the Ashas work ever. But of course, we've never had COVID before. This is the first time. I think you also had a question on a part of your question related to other outbreaks. COVID has been the first time, although I can't recall that the Uttarakhand disaster, so it was statewide, communal riots in Assam once, and Orissa cyclone have again and again proved that the ASHA is the first responder of the system. And in all of these states, they rely very, very heavily on the ASHA to be able to reach out to communities because she really is the only worker of the health system to know every household in the area. So I'll stop there. If, you, if I answered all, I lost track of so, it. Because she is the only worker, Rajni, just one follow up. Because she is the only worker, is there a sense that there will be a priority problem? I mean, as we move forward and as things are opening up, I mean, there are other issues. There's deliveries, there's tuberculosis, there's many issues the ASHA works on. Do you see an overburdening within the ambit of comprehensive primary care? So, yes. And I also wanted to make this point. Thank you for reminding me about essential services. So, in the early days, for the, I think for a couple of weeks, everything was at a standstill. There was no immunization. There were no home base. But over time, ASHA started doing that. So they did mobilize and states had different strategies for immunization. They didn't bundle up all the kids together in one room, but they had physical ways of keeping distance between the children, staggering the village health nutrition days. And ASHA came back to doing their essential services. Um, and I know that some would argue that it's because some of their incentives were linked to those essential services. And that is part, partly true, but it's also partly true, and we've seen this in 15 years, is that ASHAs are motivated by a sense of agency and this intrinsic motivation mm -hmm. um, that they're able to bring to the picture. Now, in terms of prioritization, I think they've been smart. We've also heard reports that ASHAs tell us when we're going to our household, we tend to do two or three things together. So whether mm -hmm. it's a newborn child, whether it's looking at the elderly, they tend to, they've managed their tasks in a way. I'm sure it will overwhelm them sooner or later. But as of now, there is a balance that they're managing to maintain. And they're, of course, prioritizing. It's not going to be easy after a couple of months. But for now, it's okay. okay thank you. These are the reports you. that we get from the field. Right. Thank you. And I'm going to take that to Rajiv now. Because Rajiv, though Rajni says she doesn't see a big difference across states in terms of the role of the ASHA because they've really been the first to be mobilized and been the first responders. You study health systems, you, you have worked in one of the most successful health systems in the country, but there are other states that have equally well-performing health systems. Now, do you see the response to COVID generally aligned with health system performance in the past, or are you seeing different trends? And can you tell us a little bit about what you see is driving the difference in responses, both in terms of when states responded and also how from each aspect of testing, of tracing, of public information? Yeah. Uh, when we look at the, state, I mean, the health system of the state, we generally think of hospitals. But health system, as you know, is much uh, bigger than hospitals. And uh, if you are not invested in, in, in those uh, aspects, uh, the health system resilience, which is a measure of how well a system responds to a shock, and how the essential uh, system, uh, essential things are carried out will get affected. <clears throat> so, what you will see would be states that have invested in uh, hospitals are certainly important, but areas like you know uh, uh, surveillance uh, uh, and and so on, they will do better. When I look at uh, the health systems and and uh, the resilience of health systems, there are two dimensions in which I think we need to look at uh, these things. One is internal, internal to the health system. The other one is external. Let's deal with the uh, internal part. Internal is when, you know, how good are your systems? How good, very good is your surveillance? How good is your procurement? What's your HR capacity, infrastructure? And there are some other, you know, uh, other uh, uh, not so tangible ideas like, you know, uh, morale of the force, of the workforce the delegation of powers and so on. All this generally get revealed during, during such times. And, and I don't want to take names of states, but if you look at the way states have responded, you will see that these have influenced uh, how, how, how they work things. But what's also important is that, and, and when you look at when the most uh, uh, important failure that I've seen is in the, in the surveillance part, <clears throat> in terms of uh, 
tracing and tracking and quarantining. I have argued that if states had done this, you would have you would not have seen this kind of uh, of 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 a, of a you know, booming of the epidemic because look we had we had our chances we got three months notice we had you know uh, the other uh, countries had shown how this is going to happen and if and 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 this virus was coming from a certain a certain set, set of epicenters and I believe the health systems of most states I mean I attribute that to the lack of public health awareness or public health uh, focus. Since we knew the epicenter and since the virus is coming from a certain region, we had a golden opportunity that was, I'm sorry, but frittered away. The advantage Kerala had was that we had, we'd been through this before and, you know, and uh, people knew the danger that was there. But, you know, this is, there's another, there's another part, there's another very important thing that going forward, we have to be careful about. In 2003, when China had the SARS epidemic, they hid that information. They also hid it during this time. So what many of us learned from the China 2003 experience was that if you are not transparent about data, you would be in trouble. Because if you if there is no culture of transparency, there's a pressure on on uh, uh, frontline workers not to report data. You no, know, you don't want unpleasant data coming. In. But if this data is suppressed, you're not going to take communities into into uh, into confidence. And there you are, unless unless you trust communities. Uh, people are not going to respond. And I think that's a major lesson for all the health systems uh, in this country that we have to be transparent about data. Bad news is, is uh, like that ad goes, bad news is good news for the epidemiologist because that is what will compel your response. And unless you trust communities, uh, it's not going to work. I hope at least that will be a lesson that we will, we will take forward. <clears throat> now, uh, you know, um, Again, this is not the right time to look at what different states did, but I think it will be important after this is over, whenever it is over, for people like you to take a look at to what extent did the uh, state take communities uh, into confidence, and I think that's going to that's going to show the difference, you know, in the in the response. The second part of this dimension is is how much is the health system value, especially government health system, over time. We have seen that we have laughed at government health systems. It's been derided as, as incompetent. You know, we've, we've praised the private sector. We've been talking about PPPs and so on. And what does it do to the morality of the, of the health services? You don't fund it properly. You want people to contract. And when you, when you run down health systems, and since, since the Surat uh, plague, we know that it's always in, in a crunch. It's also the government health system that comes up. I hope the second message will be that we had to work on health systems and on the government health systems to trust them. Now, when we, if the extent to which community trusts the health system is also very important, because only then the and we have seen that during the Ebola epidemic, if trusted information is not there, we will have what is happening now, which is the infodemic, the false information that goes out during an infodemic. The most important thing is to have a trusted source of information. And the best source of information in an epidemic would be the, uh, the doctors and the, the health system, the ASHA worker, everybody. But if the community does not trust the government, such, such a system, this will not get uh, uh, taken care of. So, so the answer to your question about how do health systems measure up, I think what will be important will be to look at the extent to which one, there was internal competence, uh, which will not happen overnight. As I mentioned at the beginning of this epidemic, you cannot create a health system to deal with an emergency when the emergency is in force. This should have happened in the past. I hope going forward, we'll build it up. Two, I hope we'll recognize the need for transparency that if uh, of, of sharing the, act, the, the truth, which we still don't do. And uh, also the need to take the community into confidence and let them know what is happening and mobilize them. And, cultivate a certain degree of trust of the community in the health system. So that is how I would rank different health systems. And, the, and, and I believe that when you do a post uh, facto evaluation, you will see a correlation between the points I mentioned and the response to the epidemic. And hopefully a, a place where further investments occur. I mean, if we understand that it's that level of engagement with the community that has made the difference, for example, that's where we should see greater investment. I'll come back. That's also, that. philosophy. That's also philosophy. It doesn't happen overnight. Well, I won't go into. I won't go into more of that. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I'm going to come back to that to all three of you actually, and actually that brings us perfectly to Nairine for a second because now you're sitting in Mumbai, Nairine, 
and I think you're on mute. Um, so you're sitting in Mumbai where we have, you know, seeing reports after reports of one of the big epicenters right now in the country, but has seen the health system, you know, also chug into action quite quickly. But at the same time, we hear reports of increases of domestic violence, not being able to reach the most vulnerable communities, let's say with basic information, and also that key problem that things like social distancing and hand washing are quite difficult in Dharavi, for example, where you work. So can we hear from you a bit about what has been your sense of what's happening you know, bottom up, how are communities reacting, who's been sharing information, and as Rajni mentioned, urban areas have struggled more because we don't necessarily have the same strength of a community health worker yet. So can we just hear from you a little bit about your diagnosis thus far? Sure. Thanks, first of all, Sapna, for getting me on board. Uh, and I completely agree with Dr. Rajni and uh, Dr. Rajiv about what they have said. So if you take Mumbai, and in Mumbai, there is almost 20 million population. And from the 20 million population, 41% of people live in the slum. And, and it has been a huge, huge setback for the slum to really observe social distancing, washing hands. Also because I think right now what has happened is the whole COVID situation has impinged on their livelihood. You know, they are not able to really earn money. They are not able to get out. And in slums in Bharabi and other slums in Govindi and Malwani, one family is sharing a wall with another family. So the houses are so linked. In such a situation, uh, to really talk about social distancing is a bit perfect because it just doesn't happen. And secondly, the other issues of going to the toilet, Fighting water, what are they going to do? How are they really going to live? So I think, yes, and the communities have been implementing some of the strategies on their own. Like uh, there has been quarantine in all these uh, areas, but the communities where they live, they have segregated their lanes and they are doing self quarantine in the lanes, not allowing people to enter inside. For example, for toilets. Women have been, so there have been slots. And there are slots when it's very funny that to go to the toilet, one has to really go in time slot. But it is a fact that in Mumbai, in slums, there are now time slots where men and women can go to the toilet. They carry a bucket of hot water because they want to disinfect the toilet before they go to the toilet. So these are some of the very bare issues that Mumbai communities are facing. And I think the lockdown, the direct effect of lockdown has been on domestic violence. And uh, what we see, we have been working on domestic violence and all forms of violence for the last many years. But what we really see in the last two and a half months is there has been a huge surge of reporting of domestic violence and uh, the reason the reporting has gone so much up is one is because the perpetrator i mean the family the, and the woman they're sharing the same space the space has no privacy and even small triggers right now are making the situation out of proportion and women have been reporting so women also have not been able to Oh, in this situation, earlier when their husbands were out and families were out, women had their own coping mechanisms, which are not right now present. So I think all of this situation is quite difficult. In Mumbai, we don't have ashas, but in districts of Mumbai, we do have ashas. And our other programs, which work in our maternal health program, which is working in other districts of Mumbai, has been doing a lot of work with ASHAs. ASHAs have been very forthcoming, asking for trainings on different issues. And they have been forming committees. And these committees are disaster management committees to really help provide relief to people in the slums. 
So where you haven't seen ASHAs, Nadine, who is that first resp uh, responder? So I, in, in Mumbai, where in many communities where we work, the first respondent is our community volunteers. And it is not only Sneha. I think in Mumbai, there is no dearth of NGOs working in these slum areas. So there are many NGOs who have bottled up. But I think so some NGOs are trying to do it through a network of other NGOs. Like they want to do food distribution, distribution of uh, safety kits. But NGOs like Sneha, Yuva, they have their own volunteers in the community. And I think the huge volunteer base that you one creates over a long period of time, mm. this is the time when you actually see that you are reaping the rewards of a long standing community relationship. So, all are because we are at home, we are completely stationed at home right now the ration distribution that is happening from Sneha, all the distribution of PPE kits and other things in collaboration with municipal operations is being carried out by our volunteers. Interesting. So where there isn't the ASHA, you see youth volunteers and other volunteers coming forward. So really a civil society response as well. Uh, thank you, Nairine, because that actually brings me to a question I'd like to pose to all three of you from your own vantage points is, you know, during the Ebola epidemic and in the aftermath, we hear from political leaders, at least it was community engagement that was key. We're hearing that from Rajiv right now. We're hearing it from Rajni in different ways and from you. It's now become a word that you hear a lot, actually. I've heard it in interviews with senior epidemiologists as well. If we don't engage communities in participation, but the how, as we all know, is really the struggle. How do you do that? I mean, it's one thing to say, it's another thing to actually implement over a long period of time. We have very good success stories in India as well, of ASHA's engaging women's groups in participatory learning and action, of Sneha mobilizing women's groups in Kerala between the PRI and women's groups. So we see different mechanisms, but what do you see going forward from your three vantage points a workable mechanism in different places from your vantage point that could be actually sustainable and not, as Nadine says, something that just emerges in the course of an epidemic to keep communities engaged in their health system and their own health. Rajni, I'll start with you. You're on mute. <laughs> You're on mute. Okay. Um, so Sorry, under the NHM, you know, the ASHA was not created as a solitary community health worker. The design was always that she would be rooted in the Village Health Sanitation Nutrition Committee and then later on in the Mahila Arogya Samiti. And that would be a community collective which would support her and hold her accountable. Um, unfortunately, well, whatever. The ASHA program just progressed much, much faster. And the community collectives, except in a few states, Kerala, Taka, Chhattisgarh, Orissa, Jharkhand really took off. Um, but in the rest of the states, this didn't naturally happen. Um, I think what the difference, if I can trace it back a little bit and I have to think aloud here at this point, is having a facilitatory agency or a team that supports, it doesn't happen de novo. It cannot be that the ASHA can actually engage with other community members by herself. She needs support behind her, both in terms of training, in terms of uh, supporting her to bring the collective together to have regular meetings. And I think a, a, a more recent breakthrough, which actually spans Jharkhand and Orissa, is this whole PLA approach and Madhya Pradesh too. Um, or, you know, it started off as Ekjit's work just in, as an NGO led program, but it, it has been scaled up. And where we now see ASHAs and ASHA facilitators actually facilitating women's groups and engaging and getting that kind of community participation. Uh, maybe not with the village health sanitation nutrition committees, but broader groups of people is because there are facilitatory agencies. And I think that kind of facilitatory support for the ASHA program, we needed that kind of facilitation for training. But here you need a much, much more intensive, long drawn out process for which the health system has to have the patients, the necessary uh, inputs that have to be provided to these people, both the community and the facilitators and engaging with NGOs who know how to do this. I think these three ingredients are critical. And in Kerala, you have the PRI, which is already strong, and they've sort of taken the ASHA. But in other states where we don't have that strong of a local self-government, 
these other groups are necessary and you do need a facilitatory mechanism. It cannot be done just by the health system or by the ASHA working alone. So if you need community engagement, whether it's for COVID or for other domestic mm -hmm. violence, even for things like lifestyle modification, you will need to create these platforms and facilitate it. I hope that's one lesson we've learned going forward. So a strong civil society response that's actually organized through existing or new organizations. So calling for not just government to people through the ASHA, but also a third pillar, so to speak. Okay, uh, Rajiv, from your perspective? Well, one mandatory uh, caution this is a favorite topic of mine. So when you want me to stop, just ask me to stop. Okay, otherwise, okay. it's highly likely that I'll keep continuing. Uh, what we must remember about community mobilization is that there's a lot of power dynamics involved in this. You know, uh, I will compare what happened with BRAC and what happened with ASHA. Now, uh, we know that uh, unless the community mobilizer is chosen by the community and has and the community has a right to monitor work and also sack her if needed, that kind of control, the community health worker soon becomes a bureaucrat. And Rajini may not like my saying it, but that is one danger. I mean, it's not mine. If you remember Imrana Khadir's evaluation of the of the community health worker in Madhya Pradesh, this has been this has happened in the past, and we need to see whether uh, whether that uh, whereas BRAC always ensured that that uh, Swasti Sakhi program was a was a community uh, chosen uh, person. Now, it's also likely that there are areas where space will not be available for community mobilizers. Let me give an example. When you looked at the uh, community you know, uh, feeding programs that was there for the migrants, 65% of all the community kitchens were in Kerala, but that's not the important thing. Of the, uh, of the community kitchens open in Kerala, all of them were under the PRIs, whereas the second largest was in Mumbai, except for two by government, all of them were by the NGOs. Now, do you think it is because Kerala does not have NGOs? Because there is a power dynamics that the political system does not want to see to the community, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the other non-political community organizers, organization. And that is not an accident. People believe, some people believe that an apolitical organization actually disempowers a community. You may agree or you may disagree with it, but that's a very conscious decision that is there in Kerala. So, so what has happened is uh, the uh, social mobilization in Kerala has been very clearly channeled towards the PRIs. The advantage is that at this point, the community and the government come together. It has got its uh, um, 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 negative points, but this is a this is a established system of uh, of, of uh, channeling community mobilization. The way the government and the political system have supported it is that. They have been, they have got 35% of the investable resource in the state are with the Panjayat Raj institutions. They can decide what they need to do, subject to certain limits. All the, uh, in the, in the 73rd and 74th amendment of the constitution, public health was a subject that was transferred to the local governments. And uh, in Kerala, that's been, that's been made as part of the act and all the health institutions, right from from PHCs up to district hospitals and now with Panjayat Raj institutions. And the uh, Kudumbashree movement, which actually was a, was a, was a UNICEF funded project that, uh, that started when, I mean, by me when I was a collector, has now again been co-opted into the, into the uh, semi-government system. So we ensure that the government agencies and government-led agencies do so well that there's no space left for people like uh, a great organization like Nairin's organization to come in. No? So the political space kind of gets occupied. The system that has happened in, in, in Kerala is the Ward Health and Sanitation Committee. We call it Ward Health, Sanitation and Nutrition Committee. is headed by the Ward member. It's got you know, uh, A&M, it's got the other multipurpose health workers, it's got ASHA workers, it's got volunteers, everybody there. This group has always been empowered as the group that looks at disease prevention, infection disease prevention, especially vector-borne and waterborne diseases. So traditionally, going by the, the cycle of you know, uh, infection disease in Kerala, these committees have always been mobilized and they get money. They are funded by the government and by, uh, funded by the NHM and by the panjayats. They get money to carry out community-based disease prevention activities. So the advantage was that when COVID struck, 
there was already a, 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 you know, a, a system in place for them to uh, take over. And remember, the Panjayat elections are coming up. So the Panjayat members and the people who aspire to be Panjayat members had an interest in getting involved. So, so that, was, uh, that, that, that again was what is used. So whereas a place like Mumbai and, and Dharavi is a good example. Dharavi survives on the NGOs that work there. And if it went for them, as uh, Nairin mentioned, and BMC couldn't have done anything. And BMC, I, mean, I had interacted with them. BMC was depending on these NGOs. And even at, at the beginning, in, in March 3rd, when I met the BMC people, uh, they had said that we could be depending on, they named a few NGOs, and you know, they, we could be depending on them. So the uh, 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 recently, I think, Rekhanand was who wrote a piece, opinion piece, that when the long arm of government, you know, the state and central government did not, could not reach villages, it was the structures that was available in villages that took over. This is a time when the panchayas that we alleged, except in Kerala, we keep saying in other places, you don't have capacity. The panchayats came good. And they have demonstrated that they can do well in, in, anywhere in India. The NGOs came good. So I think it's an opportunity that has seen the new uh, power structures prove their capacity. The question is, going forward, will we, will we be able to uh, co-opt them in the disease prevention activities that you have, you mentioned about uh, HIV, about uh, no, um, about uh, tuberculosis and so on. Uh, to some extent, if we involve the community, community-based organizations, you also reduce the stigma. So, will we be able to develop a new mode of working in public health that will involve public uh, uh, community institutions, whatever is there? It will change from place to place, but. Can we go beyond our, you know, our uh, trammeled uh, you know, uh, way of thinking and ensure that these these agencies are co-opted into our uh, our response? And if we do, um, there are going to be epidemics in future, and uh, sadly, this won't be the last of them. So we will be better prepared going forward to deal with it. Thank you, and I think. Nairine, it'll be important to hear from you. Then, I mean, there's obviously this sense you're on mute. There's this sense of the role of community-based organizations, but I mean, as I know from my past as well, there's also that power dynamic between community-based organizations and the government. So what is your understanding of how to move forward at least for a longer-term response and also what's happening now? Yes. Well, I think, uh, Sapna, the first thing is the proposition that one works with when you work with communities. And I think uh, the proposition is Communities are vulnerable, but they're also capable of coming up with their own mechanisms to bring about a change. And I think most of the time, NGOs and government forget this. They forget that the community has an inherent capacity to build resources and make a change. So how, when, when you do that, and when you actually analyze the resources, the community does come up with disaster management plans and plans to, for example, domestic violence. I mean, we started out with a needs assessment. And uh, most invariably what happens is, I'm talking more about NGOs and public health programs. You go with a specific direction. For example, immunization or TB. So with a direction that you want to eradicate TV or immunization, but the, but the community itself may be worried about many other things that they are facing. So I think this kind of very direct approach and NGOs taking and what uh, to be forced on community, I don't think that works at all. So like Dr. Adli said, what really works is when you do ELA techniques and when you do a lot of needs assessment and I can give you an example of Sneha that flood happened, very bad flood happened in 2005 and after that um, uh, UNICEF had declared micro planning processes in order to make a disaster management plan for communities and the micro planning processes were implemented through ELA techniques. Now actually that was a very good exercise because what happened was, that when we did a rapid assessment with the community, they came up with so many issues that were very relevant to them rather than to us. 
but i think and you'll forget this and honestly if we want to really build the immunity base or immunity volunteers then i think the most important thing is to take care of this and understand the complexities in the immunity so immunities are full of complexities like there are some leaders some people who actually have the power in their hand and how do you really decentralize that power which takes a long time you can just do it because there are deep interactions and there are different types of people holding that power in the community so i think a lot of facilitation is required there so that you build a identity of women groups and community members to really and then they are willing to act on any issue so all our volunteers are work on nutrition and violence but as of now they are all working on covid relief so i think it is how you position then and how you position your own issue is very important so uh, before i open it up to questions from our participants and audience rajni i'm going to bring it back to you for one second because something that they both said vis-a-vis uh, -vis the role of the asha now on one hand you see the asha taking on a much larger role we have comprehensive primary health care and she will have be taking on many more responsibilities there's a demand for of course making her um you know paid essentially not just through an incentive now that's there's varying views on that at the state level but how do you negotiate that tension between as rajiv said her potentially becoming a bureaucrat and also main, maintaining those links in the community i know there's no easy answer but even examples of where you've seen states negotiate this you're on mute <laughs> so the comprehensive primary health care work really began 2 years ago and i think this was a decision a conscious decision uh, in the design of the cphc and the health and wellness center work was to make the asha a sustainable worker one of the ways was to weave her as part of the primary health care team um and i think what stands us in good stead and as uh, rajiv said i think community led selection it's true that in 30 to 40% of the ashas and out of a 1 million number even 10% is a large number but community led selection did happen in several states yes patronage based selection was there but it was certainly not a selection based by medical officers or by panchayat members it was largely because she is of the community and so i think it's not the state that will have to negotiate or the system i think the asha will be the one who will negotiate what she her the community credibility that is earned over the last 15 years and the needs of the health system and what the system expects her to do the way it's designed is that she will be doing much more outreach work much more home based and community level care because care provision is one of the tasks of the asha but in the end it will be the asha because of the agency that's been built and this is again and i'm say i say it again and again it's not uniform across the country it's different in different states but it will be the asha who will negotiate and perhaps draw the balance between her uh, response to the community and her legitimate retain that legitimacy in the community and her legitimacy with the health system okay so there's uh, questions coming in i'm seeing and one common question it seems to be across a few people is well we're only talking about the asha but there's obviously other community level workers the anganwadi worker the anm in kerala you also based from pri so what are what has been the experience i think of the three working together or has the health system depended on one more than another or anything you'd like to say about that triumvirate so to speak anyone uh rajni you want to start and then i'll go to rajil yeah so uh, certainly i mean the anganwadi worker is considered the worker of the health, the wcd so as far as the health system but covid again we saw and there has been in the last few years a move towards what is called all three workers working together so micro planning by the asha the anm and the anganwadi is slowly becoming a feature in several parts of the country and certainly in covid it was the anganwadi and the asha who definitely worked together because the anm is you know one is to five she's she's not always there but these two do certainly work together and teams of asha anm and anganwadi did respond together so there is that but of course we were talking about the asha so yes obviously the conversation centered on the asha but these are two very important frontline workers as well and i think a lot of effort is going into joint training joint support and joint supervision to actually make them a team at that level because we are moving from individual workers 
two team based approaches to primary health care rajiv so i'm glad that the uh, question came up uh, because this been a tension that we've had uh, had difficulties in, in, in managing because a good anm knows a community a good uh, anganwadi workers from the community and works the local people so there are there are three people jostling for a certain space but remember in india the public health system the, the primary health center or 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 or, or a sub center caters to way more than what can safely be what can competently be handled by a system of uh, of, of of that dimension 30000 for a phc is ridiculous but most phcs in india handle much more than 50000 you know uh, what they do and whereas the uh, gpf nhs handles uh, uh, less than 2000 people so if we have to dem- to provide a comprehensive primary care the uh, hands on deck numbers have to go up. so so the challenge for the health administrator is to deftly allocate functions among you know uh, the anganwadi worker who would be you know uh, much better in terms of immunization on uh, child nutrition and uh, uh, working with uh, you know pregnant um, um, nutrition of pregnant mothers adolescents and so on Uh, uh the um, uh, what the nm will look at and what the asha will look at all this will have to be locally determined based on the local epidemiological situation uh when when you know uh, when i looked at the asha worker in kerala uh, she was the the, the incentives were aligned to help her with the asha reproductive and child health work which is not important so we reworked that and Asha's in Kerala now focus on NCDs and highly valuable member of the team. More than that, when we looked at maternal mortality, we found that prepartum depression was the fourth largest killer of mothers in Kerala, and this is something that Asha could relate to very easily because she was the community. She was seeing it, and she didn't need sophisticated analysis like that we did to come up with that. So she started screening of uh, of pregnant mothers for depression. Can you imagine it? and asha administering a depression screening mechanism and they did a fabulous job so nc so so these are these are so if depending on what your epidemiological situation is and your requirement is if you can reallocate work among these groups the amount of work that is to be done will be far more than what is available in fact we will find that that you know uh, for that this is not enough but i think what's happened is that the asha workers now at least in my in in, in the area of work where i used to work has now been commute yes now been has been converted to a not a bureaucrat but a technocrat you know uh, who is but who is respected in the community have have her value has actually gone up because you know she's no longer talking about things that we may know she's talking about new things like hypertension diabetes depression and 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 so on so i think that that reworking will have to happen at this enough uh, space for uh, enough and more space for everyone to work hmm nadeen yeah so i think my bombay experience is that municipal operation and icds they are really trying to bring this energy so that the synergies can work together but i honestly feel that there should be one apex body that really really has a vision and can give the vision to both the constituency and i think what happens is then it becomes like this is our role and that is their role so unless there is an apex body which will actually be able to hold everyone together i see the emergence not happening very well and it can happen and it can it's only a matter of building that vision for your community thank you nadeen um so i'm seeing another question both to rajni and rajiv and nadeen please also speak to it on ppe and again a lot of news reports have come out around you know lack of access to you know or sufficient ppe on the ground or what if in the case where ppe is not available and in asha refuses to do surveillance what is the is she does she have that agency as you say or is this a role that's enforced upon her regardless and what has been your experience in kerala rajiv or just as you've been looking at other states and rajni um from the role of the actual um the program 
No, it is a it is a it is a serious issue because if you if you uh, accept that she is a health worker, mm. she has every right to all the protection that we give to health workers. And if you value health worker and if you think protecting them is a is a very important thing, you, one she should have been properly trained. She should have got access to the uh, PPEs. And I I believe we should not have we should not have exposed her. There have been. The way she has been, uh, the way she has been uh, asked to do house to house surveillance, frankly, a lot of it is unnecessary. You know, it is a uh, lot of it could have been done, done over phone. I mean, so, so I, I believe in in uh, in um, in deploying Russia. Our ignorance uh, has hurt. Our um, you know, and 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 Asha worker has not been trained on a proper use of a, of, of 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 a mask. You know. So I've seen cases in which you know she will wear a mask when she goes. She starts talking. She'll pull the mask down because you know. Uh, so 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 that kind of thing we are not taking. I agree, Lakshmi. We have that's an area on which uh, you know uh, health system has. Uh, I would say failed these workers. Um, um, I, a, lo a lot of it, I think, is because of uh, lack of experience and uh, you know uh, going forward. I hope the kind of uh, you know and and remember this kind of exposure was not only for uh, for uh, uh, Asha workers. All the health workers uh, suffered from this. So a uh, lot of it is uh, is is, uh, is was our ignorance. A lot of it is bad planning. And I think uh, I think uh, Asha worker and other health workers have been unnecessarily exposed. Uh, again, going forward. In fact, we learned about uh, uh, very very very. Uh, we got a very harsh lesson on hospital electrode -like infection from the Nipah you know, uh, crisis. So I hope going forward, this is something that we will take seriously. Rajni, yeah, um, I tend to agree with Rajiv. I think this was an area, I think it's, it shows up so clearly, the lack of public health action training across the board. The fact that everybody enthusiastically pushed the ashas out and said, do house to house survey regardless of where they had to go. So I think that was a, a real issue. And yes, lack of PPEs has been there. There is one, which I mean, we are in touch with the state nodal officer. So every time, but then it's always a reactive response. Something comes up and then you're shooting off letters, calling them up and saying, make sure it reaches, make sure it reaches. Um, and, and so on both those counts, I agree with Rajiv that we, sh we could have done a far better job. And, and hopefully we learn from this experience, though God willing, it never repeats itself. And Irene, what's been the experience with the volunteers? Because I presume they may or may not have PPE. Yeah, so we have been mobilizing resources for their PPE kits and other things. But an interesting thing with the volunteers is that when we started the racket distribution and there were certain locations in the communities where we were supposed, they were supposed to deliver the packets of racket, but the volunteers get so carried away that they themselves go into the community lane and they want to really give away the food packets. And I think we had to actually come up with a volunteer uh, MOU and a volunteer uh, protocol because we don't want that these volunteers then get infected by uh, COVID. So I think it has been an important learning that uh, when when you, when ourselves, we ourselves are not in a position to do anything, how do we really hear the volunteers' energies and make them understand that this is a serious situation and how they really need to follow protocol. I think I've, just from all three of your perspectives, I mean, we all hope that we don't see the unpreparedness levels that we've seen today ever again, because we know epidemics will continue, but we also have the ongoing challenges of tuberculosis, of now non-communicable diseases as well. So the talk of public health and the attention given to public health may be unprecedented right now, but I think all of us who work in the field realize that there has been a kind of long-standing um, whether it's lack of importance or investment in public systems, as Rajiv mentioned, but also this understanding of community. So structurally, what is the big change you want to see or you advise we should see moving forward? And I can just go around, Rajni. So a structural change. You're on mute. 
the, the big structural change, and I'm going to restrict myself now to community mobilization and engagement of community health workers. I think it's critical to build community platforms and invest in them. I think far too little is done in investment and capacity building. And yes, this big lesson has taught us that we have to integrate public health action. We pay, I mean, all of the modules that have been developed for these community institutions have a big piece on how to deal with vector-borne diseases, how to deal with food safety, but we just have to make this happen. And then that requires investment. It's not cheap. I mean, the public health investment is not just about the district health system and the district hospital or facilities. It's also about investing in community systems to address health issues. So I think that would be the big structural change that I'd like to see. So both if, investment and also in the trade. Yeah. Rajiv? Yeah, given one. Ideally, I think we should move to a real public health, I mean, a primary care uh, provision. I mean, this, uh, the, 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 you know, uh, patchy kind of stuff that we are working in right now, uh, it's, it's an embarrassment. And uh, my estimation is that we will need to invest at least five times the current resources that we invest in primary care to make it even moderately effective. I hope even now, most of the talk I'm upset to see is about ventilators. It's not about, uh, uh, it's not about uh, strengthening the primary care. And we, what we forget is that the need for ventilators would have been cut down if there was a good primary care system. So please invest in primary care, you know, uh, meaningful primary care, not the changing the board and, you know, giving it fancy names, but real, you know, solid primary care with enough people and enough capacity. Yeah, so I think I agree with both of them and Ganyan building up as it is of the community to be prepared with a disaster management plan and to be prepared that you know anything can just arrive at the doctor is very very important. Uh, indigenous solutions that come from communities are far far more plausible than solutions that the government or NGOs come up with. So that is definitely a platform for communities that we need to really work on. And as Dr. Rajiv said, it shouldn't be active that someone is doing this somewhere and someone is doing it in some part of the country. But it has to be kind of uh, in, ingrained into the public health system's work so that it becomes a regular intervention. So I think we're hearing very similar things from the three of you in terms of investment in primary health care, investment in communities and community mobilization, but not just for health care. And I think on a sort of positive note, there are states and we do see um, increasing discussion at least of the social determinants of health as well. One of the things we must invest in outside of a health worker and a community um, I mean, whether it's capacity building or training, but also addressing social determinants like sanitation. You know, in a way, Rajiv, as you say, if we had strong primary health care, we wouldn't have seen this need for ventilators. But I would take it one step earlier and say if we had had strong, you know, social determinants addressed, whether they're water, sanitation, access to other facilities, we may not have needed such an emergency response either. So where do you see kind of promises or promising spots? for investment in both community healthcare and social determinants. And I'll close with this. Rajni? You're on mute again. The theme. Hmm. Sorry. So yes, of course, it's need, not an either or. Both have hmm. to be invested in. And if you want to work with community, if community investments are what we're talking about in addition to primary health care, then social determinants will obviously have to be first because they're always a felt need of the community. And so I think this demands multi-sectoral convergence. We didn't talk about it today, but I think that's something we've seen. It's not the health department alone that can deliver on all of these things, nor should the health department either be held accountable for it or be made responsible for it. So it, this, this thing about sectoral collaboration, particularly in urban areas, is uh, that is fallen. Urban local bodies have not been shown up to be as strong as the panchayat areas, even okay. in states where panchayats are not as strong. So I think that... So maybe action on social determinants of health led by a range or a group of other ministries will, or sectors, and bringing together a range of stakeholders is also very, very important. Rajiv? Sapna, I need not remind an epidemiologist that a virus infection can't be controlled by social determinants. No, but, no, 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 I, no I, I, was, I was pulling a leg. 
Now, uh, you know, uh, but I agree. A lot of, uh, and if you look at the Almaty or the you know, Astana declaration, very little of that is actually done by the health uh, department. A lot of it is actually outside the health department. Which is why, you know, uh, in, in, I mean, in, 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 which is a logic for transferring health to the panchayats because, I mean, to the local bodies, because local bodies control housing, they control nutrition, they control safe water. So most of the determinants, so if you embed health planning in the planning for the, the total planning of a local body, you will end up addressing the social determinants also. So, so the message going forward would be planning for health has cannot be standalone it has to be embedded in the planning for the larger uh, thing but that's easy said and done i hope going forward we will develop the systems to do that having tried to do that i can assure you it's not easy you know even even aligning the health plans of panchayats with that of the state with the nhm itself was a nightmare so you know other issues are going to be difficult but we have to keep working at it Larry? yeah so i think one is of course what they said is in a sectoral collaboration and coordination. But I, I very quickly, I in Dharavi, there are only 225 toilets. And the municipal operation for years have been trying to build more toilets. But the people are not giving away their land and their houses. So I think, I think what I want to say is how do we navigate and how do we really through these systems so that we can have better means of living is something which in this intersectorial collaboration people need, need to think through. And till today, I'm talking 10 years ago when we did the PLA and the micro planning, till today Dharabi doesn't have more toilets. And the reason is the municipal operation says that we can't do anything. You mobilize the community and you tell us where we can build toilets. So I think it, it it is about really how we take communities into confidence, we give them an alternative plan, and then we kind of make the conditions better for the living. So on that note, I will first thank all three of you so much. I know you're incredibly busy. Um, work hasn't stopped at all for anyone, especially during this time. And I see Rajani's in her office as well, still in the ministry. So thank you all three of you for being here today. And I think what's been the biggest learning for all of us in all of the public conversations we've been hearing about COVID is we've been hearing the word community. We've been hearing the word, the importance of really mobilizing communities, investing in mobilization and investing in primary health care, both the services and the underlying determinants. So we hope, we can only hope that this is a lesson for us moving forward in the next, not just new epidemic, but our persistent challenges that we face. So thank you, Asia Society, very much. And I think we will close here. And I believe there are even more questions and I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but hopefully we'll have a chance to hear from all three of you again. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.